Hello folks, welcome along to the vlog. This is a little bit of a prequel to what is going to be a considerably long rambly video. So, obviously, new lockdown, new project. This project is to build a control panel for our cask washer and in the future we're going to be building a brand new cask washer as well. But this mainly focuses on the control panel. Now, the reason I'm doing this prequel to it all is because it's a 30 long, a 30 long, a 30 minute long video and uh, unless you're technical and you want to get into the aspect of uh, circuit diagrams even though they evolve massively from what I show you here then maybe this video isn't for you and perhaps you'll want to skip on to the next one. The next one will include much more of the build and then right at the end if I have time We'll run over it all, we'll show you it working, and then with any luck, I'll be able to put a schematic of the actual functioning um, final article on our website, harrisonsbrewery.com, for you all to see. Anyway, there you are, you're pre-warned, this does go on a little bit, so uh, feel free to skip to the next video if you so wish. Well, here it is. Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome along to the video and uh, today what we're going to be doing is putting together a control panel for our cask washer. So I'll do a few sketches and let you know what the crack is with this. So we've got this cask washer okay, and uh, we use it of course to wash casks. So we basically have three tanks like this next to each other all with spray balls in like that and what tends to happen is we bring casks into the brewery we put them on the middle uh, tank which is a rinse tank and we turn the water on and it washes all of the uh, hop debris yeast all that kind of jazz out of the tanks away down the drain and cleans them out so we'll have to rinse all the casks that we've got and then we put them to one side ready for uh, a proper clean before we use them on a brew day and then what will happen we, we have this uh, caustic tank over here and this has got an element in it and we heat this up to about 65 degrees C in order to allow the caustic to work really quite at its most efficient on any uh, crap, crud, um, what's the correct term I'm looking for, any biofilms, uh, any fatty deposits, any yeast kind of crowds and rings inside the casks, all that kind of stuff. We want the hot caustic to do its, to, to help us get rid of all that stuff, which is why we have an element in there and in order to make sure that we have the correct liquid level above the element before we turn it on, we have a little crane's bell float valve in there, which actually helps to isolate the power supply via a contactor at the moment to the element. And uh, all of these, apart from the rinse tank at the moment, are powered by a pump. So we have like a pump and uh, sucks in the caustic from the bottom of the tank, spurts it out to the spray ball and he sprays inside. It's a rotary spray ball as well. He sprays inside the tanks or inside the casks or kegs, whatever we've got. And then it drains out of the bottom back into the tank. So it's just recirculating that liquid. And then once we've given it a caustic wash, we'll then put it back on the rinse tank. And as I said, this is operating from mains pressure at the minute. In the future, we're gonna incorporate a pump into the rinse tank as well and run it from a, an IBC water reservoir so we don't have to pull from the mains. And then again, once it's rinsed, got rid of any caustic, we then have an acid tank and this acid tank contains PAA or paracetic acid 
you could, I suppose, if you was a home brewer and built a setup like this, I don't see why you'd build it this uh, a big setup like this for rinsing bottles or corny kegs, but gives you an idea. You could, I suppose, just um, uh, use what's it called, star san, and uh, use that too. Uh, of course, it foams. PA doesn't foam, so that's that's why we use PA in the brewery. We don't want anything foaming inside these tanks because foam causes problems when you're cleaning. It's all right um, if you're sanitizing something like a, a work surface or inside a keg one at a time. But if you're doing item after item after item, it's a pain in the ass. So you don't want it foaming. So all we do, exactly the same thing with the acid, goes into a pump and uh, gets sprayed out of the spray ball into the cask and... Uh, sanitizes the cask and what we'll do from there uh, we'll take it away and we'll immediately fill it with beer so there are two or three phases to the cleaning process uh, so phase one casks in in or keg and rinse and then you can you can effectively stop there okay and pause until the next cycle and then you've got caustic and rinse. And again, you can stop there. Let's just write stop, stop. And you can stop there and you can store the casks at either of these two stages or kegs. You don't need to go any further. And then finally, you've got acid. The difference with the acid is you can't stop. You've got, I like to say, just in the same day, like 12 hours, 12 hours or eight, but a lot of people say you've got to uh, fill within 12 hours. Fill within, what the hell? Yeah, fill within 12 hours, 12 or 24 hours and that's basically the cycle that we use for uh, cleaning casks kegs even cornies because it's uh, it's there and we make sure that uh, we don't have any kegs or casks in the building that haven't at least gone through this rinse cycle so we're not bringing kind of smelly um, kegs and casks that have got old beer into the brewery where you could harbour pests like flies and fruit flies and all that kind of stuff or even mould or anything like that. So we normally bring them in, rinse them and then because you don't have to fill the two side tanks up you can just rinse everything by just using the rinse tank and you don't need to heat any water up or anything like that. We generally just do the rinse phase and then stack them on a pallet until we need the casks. And then on casking day, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll fill up the caustic tank with, uh, we use Cosgleam Plus in our caustic tank, available from Niche Solutions in the UK. And then in our acid tank, we'll use Persid 15 from Niche Solutions, and uh, that works for us. That's what we've been doing from day dot. We've been doing this for five years now, and it's it's the way to do it. Um, right. What we were thinking about doing in the future was maybe incorporating another rinse tank on the side here, which you could do if you were on all the time. And then you could go rinse caustic, rinse acid, fill, all in one day, really quick, with no waiting time. But that's not something that we're going to do with ours, because I think the system that we've got going works fine. Uh, so, at the moment, everything's manual. The pump's manual, the heater is on, uh, um, what do you call it, a thermostat, so that kind of gets up to temp on its own, but you still need to turn it on and off. And we have a drain pump as well for the rinse tank to pump away all of the used uh, dirty water. What we want to do is change that up to a waste pipe size 40 millimeter size outlet and get rid of 
uh, the waste pump, which means we don't have to worry about it getting blocked up because what tends to happen is you get, because it's basically a washing machine pump, you get little things stuck in there and it bungs up the old, uh, the old drain valve, so we need to get rid of that part of it. And then also what I'd like to incorporate in there is some type of timer. So instead of standing there and like guesstimating one minute, two minute, whatever you want to have for the cycle of the tanks, you just push a start button and it'll cycle through at exactly the right amount of uh, time that you want it to. So we're going to build a control panel effectively is where I'm going with this little uh, intro. And the control panel is going to take all of these uh, actions that we do manually and it's going to look after them for us. So we can turn around and be doing other things such as cleaning old stickers and labels off the casks or de-shiving or de-removing keystones ready to put on the rinse tank or whatever. And these two acid and caustic and rinse tanks even, or three of them, will run for a set amount of time. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a control panel, I'm resting on one now, and we're going to incorporate several uh, elements into this control panel. First one being a key on and off switch there. And then secondly, I'm not sure if this is going to be the layout, that key on and off switch will turn everything on of course. And then we'll have uh, an STC 1000 controlling our tank temperature. And uh, that'll look after that'll look after the uh, caustic temp. Okay. Just like that. And then on the side of that, we're going to have another switch. For, oh, I've done it again, for turning the element on and off, so it won't be on all the time. Of course, this is going to be protected with a float valve, and the way we're going to turn these on and off with an STC 1000 is we're just going to run 12 volt control through a 40 amp solid state relay to switch the element. And then underneath that, we're going to have timers. We'll have timers for all three tanks. And we'll run them for, let's say, 30 seconds. It's probably going to be more than that. But we'll say argument sake 30 seconds. And then underneath these timers, we're going to have independent on off switches and the idea behind these is when you turn this control panel on the timers that we've got which are these Inkbird IDTE timers they'll run straight away from power up so you don't want any accidental firing okay mate yeah cheers Stu so you don't want any accidental firing when you power up the panel. I might be able to incorporate a little circuit break which prevents that happening in the future, but I'm not sure yet. I'm thinking about using an emergency stop button on the panel. So you power it up, you go away, you start to fill your tanks up and everything. And then you come back and you turn on your uh, emergency stop button to allow power to go to the pumps or maybe we just keep these powered all the time and have the keys do that emergency stop thing instead I don't know yet but that means we will be incorporating an emergency stop valve in there somewhere as well uh, so that's pretty much all we're going to have on the front of the control panel Inside, it's going to be a little bit different. We're going to have solid state relays for all these three timers. We're going to have an RCD, which is going to fetch all the power into the unit because everything's going to be protected uh, via a trip. We don't want any accidents. But the main 
control panel will house and control all the high voltage switching but everything on the front here apart from obviously these two these three timers they're powered by 240 all the switches will be low voltage emergency stop will be low voltage anything that you're touching and turning um, which isn't double insulated such as these these uh, selector switches here or indeed uh, the momentary switches that we'll be using to turn the uh, the pumps on and off they will all be uh, low voltage 12 volts or thereabouts so this is how we're going to control uh, the elements and the pumps but then over at the tank you don't want to be walking backwards and forwards to the control panel all the time so over at the tank we're going to have to incorporate uh, a little um, IP65 or IP56 project box uh, besides every single tank and that's going to house um, an on and off, a manual override so you can turn the pump on and off regardless of the timer state a start button for the timer of course and then just in case uh, somebody hits the timer switch accidentally and uh, obviously you're going to have to run over to the main panel to, to turn it off. Each one will have its own little emergency stop button as well. So if you do it by accident, you can just emergency stop it, wait till the timer's run down, and then reset, and away we go again. So that is the theory behind what we're going to build. I hope you followed along with me. It's another one of those projects that... Uh, I am literally making up as I go along. This is the first time I've drawn out any schematics. So all I'm going to do is dive straight into the electrics and see if we can't figure out how to control this whole thing. So basically what we're going to have here, I would imagine, on our control panel, is we're going to have power in. I'll do this big Clive style AC in. And the first thing it's going to hit is an RCD and that RCD is going to look after uh, all the power and all the people working with it and then of course this is just going to go down to a negative rail as well you need to have a negative connector on your RCD uh, and then from the RCD uh, we may go through the key switch, or the key switch may control a contactor which switches the mains. But to simplify it here, we'll just put key SW. So obviously, if we switch, if we use that switcher relay, then fair enough. If not, it's just the key switch turning on the mains, and the mains will run across. And uh, well, I suppose first thing it's going to hit is um, a solid state relay for the heater SSR heat there we go and then that's obviously going to go out to the heater and then it's obviously going to come back again onto the neutral just like that and then from the solid state uh, relay what's further down the line well we're going to have all the timers timers are going to be there as well and these timers all need to power solid state relays timer SSRs and then those timer SSRs will power pumps and then obviously back to the negative rail again so each one of these components the SSR the timers the timer SSRs are all going to have um, auxiliary power supply uh, not auxiliary power auxiliary control circuits as well for instance the heater SSR is going to have it's um let's say it's kicking we're feeding it with a 24 volt supply dc positive that's going to run through 
um, a contactor on an STC 1000, which we've got here, which we can put in live, neutral, positive, uh, SSR. Hold on a sec. Ah, interrupted by the Amazon delivery guy. So we've got the uh, solid state relay powered by the STC 1000, positive and negative. That's going to switch the mains for the heater there. And then what we can do to make sure that this is protected, we can break the positive or the negative and we can run that through a float switch which we'll have incorporated in the tank. So, have I got one knocking around here? I did have some delivered recently, but I, don't, I can't find it. Yeah, here we have it. Look, a couple of magnetic float switches. Screw these into the side of the tank, tighten them up, and then when the liquid level rises, it connects the circuit, and because it's low voltage, you're not getting any sticking contacts in there or anything. So that's the contactor being controlled, or the solid state relay being controlled by an STC 1000 and a float switch. And then when that's uh, ready for temp, obviously we're going to have our TC thermocouple in the tank as well. But uh, that'll turn the heater on. And then the other kind of ancillary um, circuitry that we'll have with the timers is obviously they've got 24 volts there as well uh, sorry 240 volts in there as well uh, and then these timers come with a built-in 12 volt output which is extremely handy so we'll be using that 12 volt out 12 volt output to control the SSR here we go again so we can have a positive coming out and that can run through to our um, push button switch. No, that won't. It will run through our selector. Selector switch. And then through the E stop. If that makes any sense. And then back to, or well, then into the positive of there. And then back across, we'll have a negative cable coming across. So you'll see the positive does a loop through these two components. Select a switch, turn it on and off. The emergency stop, turn it off completely. And that will turn on the pump for the solid state relay and the timers. Um, then we also want to incorporate the timer section of this little uh, get up here. And we do that by incorporating... 12 volts to the reset of the gate uh, of the um, terminal 3 of the ink bird so we want that 12 volts to come out through the push button like that and then back across and into the timer again into we'll just write 3 here into terminal 3 of the timer and that push button alone will um, reset the uh, timer, which will open these terminals here, the normally open and the normally closed terminals. So what we're actually going to do as well is incorporate these relay switches here into this section so we can bypass the selector switch. We're coming through the e-stop as well at the same time. But just imagine, before this selector switch cable, this 12 volt positive feed reaches the selector switch, we also take it around and we take it to the common or number 7 of our timer. And then from there, we'll take our normally open or number 8 and we'll run that through the... Oh, we'll go that way through the e-stop as well ignore that line and then once these two are connected or powered by the timer because these are basically a switch 
like that. Once these are powered and energized, that will set the timer off. And when the timer's finished its thing, that will open again and it will turn off the power to the solid state relay, thus turning off the power to the pump. And to confuse things a little bit further, in between this whole section, we have to also add a selector switch to isolate the timers from the individual control units that we're going to build later on. So I hope you're keeping up. I probably lost everybody. Um, and don't take this as a proper schematic. Jesus Christ, it's a bit messy. But it'll be easier for you to see what's happening when we get down to the build. And talking of getting down to the build, as you can see, we have a table full of components which we're going to start playing around with today and uh, drilling holes in control panels and all that kind of jazz. As you can see on the table over here, I've started doing some beta testing with it all. And my next job is to figure out what layout we're going to have on the control panel and start cutting holes. But we'll save that all for another video. I think I've covered enough on this. I've given you an idea as, as to what I want to be doing. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a long convoluted video if I keep it all in one piece. So I'll title this something like a cask wash control panel uh, planning or something. I don't know. And then we'll do a little mini series with all these all these uh, components being installed and then finally seeing it up and running at the end. Uh, one caveat, of course, though. I'm just doing this to upgrade the control systems on the existing cask washer because I'm concerned of the safety. Uh, safety is paramount in this situation. I'm concerned that we may not have as safe an electronic control on the existing one. So we're just going to change out this control circuitry on the existing cask washer. And then when we're back open again and the COVID restrictions are light -er than they are now, and we're making some money, because at the minute we're losing money, uh, then what we'll do is invest in a brand new cask washer and build. This will stay the same, but I want to build some stainless steel tanks on the cask washer to deal with perishable acid and stuff like that, which is a whole new kettle of fish that we can talk about in another video. But when we come to the last video of this little mini series, you'll think, oh God, look at the state of that cask washer. It's all right, it works, it does its job. This is all about the control panel. So uh, we'll see you on the next video anyway. That's enough for today. And uh, I'm gonna start marking out, drilling and cutting. And then hopefully we can come back with some components in this box.